Welcome to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. I am John Gulliver, and I will introduce the seminar series and our speaker. This series of seminars is co-sponsored by the Water Resources Center and the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, both at the University of Minnesota. Our speaker today is Dr. Michelle Simon, a senior chemical engineer for the Water Infrastructure Division of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Michelle is the lead and primary point of contact for the stormwater management model, or SWIM. She also works with other watershed models, such as the National Stormwater Calculator, HSPF, Caneros 2, HEC, and SWAT. She previously worked with Hydrus and ModFlow on EPA's Superfund sites. So I believe it's safe to say that Michelle knows these large public models that are primary product of the US EPA and of great value to practitioners throughout the world, not just the United States. Michelle has served as a branch chief for the Urban Watershed Branch of the EPA's Water Resources and Water Supply Division, where she supervised 20 staff and several multi-million dollar multi-year projects. These projects include the Aging Water Infrastructure or Condition Assessment and Rehabilitation, Green System Response to Climate Change, um, Green Infrastructure Projects performed at multiple US EPA laboratories and the Swim Soap Sustain modeling effort. Michelle received a BS in chemical engineering from Notre Dame University, an MS in chemical engineering from the Colorado School of Mines, and a PhD in soil, water, and environmental science from the University of Arizona. Today, she will be talking about green infrastructure research at the US EPA. So it is my, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michelle Simon. Hi, everybody. Thank you, John. That was a very, very exhaustive introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone coming here this morning um, to hear this talk. Uh, I was so impressed with all with this whole series and with your previous speakers, such as Bill Hunt and Rob Traver and Elizabeth Fashman back and Bridget. And, um, and so hopefully uh, it's a pretty uh, hard act to follow. So hopefully this won't be uh, too embarrassing for the poor EPA. As John, as John says, I am with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. In 2010, I started working as the Urban Watershed Branch Chief, and I did worked with a lot of projects on green infrastructure. My group did uh, the modeling, such as SWIM, and then also empirical work. And I'm going to talk about a lot of work done by a lot of people. And I'm probably not, I'm definitely not going to do all of these projects justice. I'm going to talk about primarily the model, the, the empirical data that I'm using to strengthen SWIM. And I encourage you to take a look at uh, each of the slides and I will have the lead uh, investigator and recent publications and you're welcome to ask me any questions um, or else get a hold of the individual with the EPA. Uh, before I start, I'm obliged by the EPA to say that although they approved of this talk, the opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the author and not necessarily of the agency. So no official endorsement is um, inferred. And I will be mentioning some uh, trade names and commercial products, and I'm not implying endorsement of any kind. I'm just using these names so that they could be useful for, um, for uh future referenced and I invite you to also contact those uh, commercial entities if you wish for more information on the product. So today, uh, after the introductions, I'm going to talk about SWIM, Stormwater Management Model. It's a very popular watershed model, especially for urban watersheds. Then I'm going to talk about some of the green infrastructure modeling research, the empirical research where we get the data to uh, improve the scientific underpinnings of SWIM, and then conclude. I'm going to talk about a lot of people's work, not just my own. And, um, uh, and so let me kill off my, um, that's it. I'll stop my video because I have bandwidth issues. Okay, I'm going to talk about a lot of people's work. Um, in EPA, it's the, usually it's the last name and then the first name, and then at epa.gov. In each slide, I will identify the lead investigator, recent uh, publications. I'll probably highlight 
the data that I am using to, to work on SWIM. There's far more work that's going to be covered into these projects, and I encourage you to take a look at them and contact the EPA individual that's in charge of it. I also, all this work has been done by a lot of uh, postdocs and ORICE undergraduate students and postgraduate students have been working with us. They typically are the lead author on the publication. Most of the folks that I'm mentioning are, not, are no longer with the EPA, but are still uh, starting very vibrant careers in the green infrastructure community. One of the uh, folks, it's my colleagues are Jason Bernagros, Michael Bors, Matt Hopton, Steve Kramer, Ann Michelonis, Tom O'Connor, Catherine Ratliff, Arimala Sudakumar, and Michael Tribby. One of the gentlemen who you'll see prominently in a lot of the work that I'm talking about is Michael Borst. He's on the phone right now, and if we have any questions that I cannot answer, he can be available at the end of the talk to get into whatever kind of detail folks would be interested in covering today. Okay. Let's see. All right, what is SWIM? SWIM, Stormwater Management Model, is a public domain, distributed, dynamic, hydrologic, hydraulic water quality model used for continuous simulation for runoff quantity and quality from primarily urban areas. I don't know if you can see my, um, my cursor here, but rain falls onto a subcatchment. Some of it infiltrates, some of it exfiltrates, some of it runs off. If it runs off, it goes into a hydraulic system pumps, pipes, tanks, and, um, and uh, SWIM was primarily designed so that uh, people could use it for combined sewer overflows and designing their equipment to handle, to reduce the design, the uh, combined sewer overflows. SWIM was started by the University of Florida, CDM Smith, and many other entities, uh, Colorado State of Fort Collins. In the early 2000s, um, my EPA colleague, Ru Lou Rossman, took SWIM 4, which was written in Fortran, and um, rewrote it, refactored it, in fact, into C, and released SWIM 5 uh, in 2005. SWIM is unique, um, or perhaps is particularly strong, I should say, in the hydraulic system. A lot of watershed models like HSPF and is agricultural runoff, HSPF is usually for watershed runoff. SWIM is particularly strong in urban environments and particularly strong in designing hydraulic systems. You can use SWIM to calculate uh, flow through pipes, size of tanks. Um, oh, I hope that we don't have trouble. Uh, let me know, Andy, if, you, if we end up having to go to a different avenue for this. We're doing good so, so far, Michelle, thank you. Okay, uh, and so, SWIM is particularly strong in hydraulics, and it's probably best used for hydraulics. In 2010, when I started working with him, uh, Lou Rossman added green infrastructure to SWIM. And now SWIM is very heavily used for green infrastructure. Unfortunately for EPA and for, uh, for me, was that Lou Rossman retired in 2015, so I take, took over being the EPA point of contact for SWIM. But luckily for me, and for all of us, Lou Rossman is still active as an emeritus um, EPA employee. He's continually developing SWIM. And thank God, I talk to him about once a month and he's still very active. I'd also like to highlight my colleagues, Michael Tribby and Catherine Ratliff, who are helping, working on the development of the actual SWIM code itself. EPA needs SWIM for combined sewer overflows as a permitting. And it's helpful in the design and sizing of the drainage system, control of combined and sanitary sewer overflows, modeling inflow and infiltration in sanitary sewer systems, generating non-point source pollutant loadings for waste load allocations, and evaluating green infrastructure. Uh, many people, SWIM has been downloaded on average 30,000 times annually in the last 10 years that I've been involved with the project, and lots of folks use it. There's a GIS SWIM and R SWIM. SWIM is the basis of XP SWIM, Info SWIM, uh, PC SWIM. There's a lot of commercial products that use SWIM, um, and uh, and uh, and you and uh, a lot of people in industry, consultants, academia are using SWIM. I understand from John that a lot of folks at the University of Minnesota are also using SWIM for uh, runoff and water quality within runoff. I encourage folks to take a look at some of these um, sites that use SWIM, particularly Open SWIM by Kai Water. They have a SWIM listserv. They have a, a very 
uh, nice uh, swim code viewer. I find it an excellent tool and I use it heavily myself. Okay, one thing, uh, one project that's being done that they're using swim to calculate CO uh, COVID detection. In Arizona, Hart and Halden use SWIM to calculate uh, kinetic parameters for uh, COVID-19 attenuation in wastewater at different temperatures throughout the world. I have a map there um, of the certain of the sites that they work. They're in Tempe, Arizona, and they can use SWIM to, to uh, strategically sample sewers so they can find communities that have a high amount of COVID-19. My EPA colleagues, Jay Garland and Nicole Bergman are working with Greater Cincinnati Waterworks to look at COVID-19 detection in Cincinnati. You can find, and this, this work was started last summer and it's ongoing. I invite you to go to this particular uh, webinar series to see their up-to-date work that's being done. EPA also is doing other co uh, coronavirus research in terms of uh, detection, analytical methods, and uh, there's a second um, uh, reference there for, for our web page. Hart and Hayden published their, their work and uh, it's very impressive. I've also worked with, um, I've also been in contact with people like Marcus Quigley and Colorado State University and a bunch of people who are looking at COVID detection in various different parts throughout the country. I don't know if there's folks in uh, Minnesota who are also in this work. But SWIM is, is definitely very useful because it can come up with flow rates and retention times and other pro, and, uh, dilution and other uh, factors that would make it easier to detect COVID-19. Alrighty, Lou was uh, primarily and pretty much the only developer on EPA side uh, to work on SWIM and SWIM 5. When he retired, Michael Tribby, Catherine and I tried to, to fill in as best we could. One of the things that we've recently done, recently in terms of 2016, is started a GitHub site. Here is the location of the official EPA stormwater management model. Here's a GitHub site. We recently released a SWIM 15 with copious help from Lou and testing with various different members of the SWIM community, such as Bob Dickinson with Innovise and uh, Rob James with Kai Water and I myself. And uh, th this GitHub site site is a location for the official release of SWIM. You also can get it from the uh, US EPA. So you can download a working copy of SWIM from US EPA's website on an, on an earlier website that I had. An active community called Open Water Analytics um, is also working on developing SWIM. They're fixing bugs, they're adding features. Uh, there's about 70 really um, active programmers and we're coming up with a system to accept code from various different people who are not within the EPA. I also encourage you if you're a coder or a programmer to go to this GitHub site and there's a lot of really active work. They have something called PySwim so that you can do Monte Carlo uh, running of swim and do a lot of um, you can uh, get different uh, data. There's APIs that one can get different data from SWIM. And it's a very useful active group. Uh, Michael, Catherine, and I are also part of this group and we encourage you to, to check them out as well. Alrighty, so that's a SWIM development. I have another talk on how we code and how we develop SWIM. And I'm actually gonna be giving it in uh, virtually in Toronto at the end of February. And if anyone's interested in that, drop me an email. I'll give you some of the mechanics and how you can add to the code of SWIM. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about some of the green infrastructure studies that have been done by the EPA and how we use it to ground truth and improve the scientific underpinnings of SWIM. Michael Borst and several others are in Edison, New Jersey, and they're working with Camden, and the city of Camden, New Jersey, as well as Stevens Institute with Dr. Elizabeth uh, Feisman Beck, who I know recently has moved to California, but is still actively working with us on green infrastructure and SWIM. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of projects that are in New Jersey. Michael Borst and colleagues are working in um, Louisville, Kentucky. They have permeable pavement and infiltration galleries. And Michael, Doug Beek, and several EPA people are looking at infiltrating water and groundwater impacts and uh, tree uh, planters. I, um, I worked on a project in Kansas City, a rain garden project, which I'll go into some of the detail of. And Michael and colleagues are working at, at uh, Fort Riley, uh, Kansas City. And I have a project in Fort Irwin, California, 
in Cal Fort Irwin, unfortunately, is in the Mojave Desert. There's, when it rains, it pours. They have a lot of trouble with erosion, but they really need every drop of water they can get because they only get five to six inches annually. So I want to talk about some of the projects that we're working on in Fort Irwin, California. All right, in Edison, New Jersey, there's, um, there was a one acre site that was built with permeable pay, uh, parking lots. Michael Borse, Tom O'Connor, Ari Malasa Pukumar, and many other postdocs, which I will identify in, in, with the aspects of the projects, have worked on this parking lot. It was con the construction was completed in 2009. It's a one acre site. In 2010, we have developed a very comprehensive set of infiltration data. Um, and water quality data from this site. They have uh, porous concrete, uh, permeable interlocking concrete pavers, por whoops, excuse me, porous concrete, and then porous asphalt. We, they have got um, infiltration uh, hydrology studies as well as uh, water quality studies, which I'd like to go into detail. They also built some rain gardens. There's six different rain gardens of various different sizes that have flow coming uh, laterally, or I guess from left to right into the rain garden, as well as runoff from the roof of the, of the building. And I want to talk about that first, the rain gardens in Edison, New Jersey. In federal and state rain garden manuals, they talk about you want to have a rain garden of a certain size for a drainage area of a certain size. One of the things that we found here in Edison is uh, when you have uh, lateral flow coming into the rain gardens, you have to be very careful with picking the plants. You want to make sure that they are going to be able to grow in the soil and uh, weather conditions that you have. You certainly don't want to put in invasive plants. And if you want it to be a garden, you want it to look ornamental. Uh, but you want to have, but, but it's particularly important for the uh, plants that are closest to the water flow to handle uh, flood, drought, and salt. And so it takes some effort to come up with the right kind of plants um, and the right size of garden so that you're able to uh, size and have a, a uh, let's see, a, a, a prosperous garden, a verdant garden for the, under your conditions. There's a couple of papers, Brown, O'Connor and Borst, and then O'Connor and Eamon. Uh, Robert Brown is a former student of uh, Bill Hunt from North Carolina. It's one of the wolf pack, and uh, you'll see many um, publications from him in my following slides. Michael Borst and uh, Fazana Amid, who I understand is Dr. Culliver's uh, student here from the University of Minnesota, worked on some um, tree boxes that were in Louisville. Michael, the University of Louisville, Louisville and Jefferson County NFC, put in some tree boxes, some infiltration galleries, and some permeable pavement. One of the things I like, many, they, did, they found out many things, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is they put in different um, time domain reflectometers at different depths in these tree boxes. Water flows, there's a lot of uh, drainage area from this first tree box here. It flows into the inlet, fills up, evaporates, infiltrates. When it becomes full and can no longer infiltrate, uh, the flow comes out into the curb, goes to the next one and the next one and the next one, eventually ends up in a sanitary sewer. In SWIM, we use the green amped equation to do infiltration for the LID modules. And I'm sure everyone here has spent a lot of their time coming up with FPs and TPs and so on to calculate the green app. We were able to um, take the data from the, um, uh, let's see, Ahmad's and Borst and, and go through um, the infiltrating and then the saturated and draining. And we were able to ground truth the calculations that were within SWIM. Michael is working with Dr. Fassman and uh, Karen Neeson on some planters that are at the Stevens Institute. There are several different, and he has also got some that were in Camden. In Camden, they had a series of planters, and they, the first one got saturated, and then all the water overflowed, and they weren't able to get the other three planters to really establish. So they're starting over again. They're looking at um, individual planters on the Stevens Institute in Hoboken, New Jersey. And they found that the planters completely captured about 40% of the storms. And the controlling variables were the initial uh, uh, moisture deficit and, um, and, and the size of the, of the of box. And they were able to come up with some calculations on um, when you have rain, you have, you, know, you have an initial moisture deficit. As, it, as the dry soil becomes saturated, you have a leg, and then eventually start to have overflow. And they're helping, they're using these data to correctly size planters. Okay, 
Another thing that we tried to do with SWIM is ground truth and hydrology. The LED modules were added in 2010, started in about 2005. We found some, some of these studies were not complete yet, so we found some studies in the literature, some from NC State, some from Villanova, some from other parts of the country. We looked at bioretention, bioswale, green roof, permeable pavement, and infiltration trench. We had a well-defined study with a very, um, carefully controlled set of param measured uh, parameters and we were able to come up with Nash Sutcliffe um, efficiencies, percent bias, R RS, Rs, and an index of agreements. And by and large, the SWIM LID module did a pretty good job. One notable exception was an infiltration trend at uh, Villanova. It was very deep. Uh, SWIM is one dimensional, as my slide previously showed that you have one dimension with Green Ant. When you, if you have a deep infiltration uh, trench, you're going to have a lot of exfiltration. And uh, John Kwai Lee uh, worked on modeling the hydraulic pro um, processes that are external versus the one dimensional infiltration, vertical infiltration that SWIM typically does. But by and large, SWIM, do, SWIM does a pretty good job with uh, hydrology. Another project that was started by Richard Fields, some of you may know him, he's one of the stalwarts, or I guess he was active from 1970 to 2012, worked on installing rain gardens in Kansas City, Missouri. He worked with Kansas City, Missouri, MSD, Tetra Tech, University of Missouri, Kansas City. He took a hundred acre plot and every single uh, public right-of-way he put in bioretention, infiltration gallery, or rain garden. So we, this particular 100-acre plot, we put as much green infrastructure as we possibly could. And um, EPA evaluated the response of green infrastructure, as did um, MSD. Here is an excellent uh, report from MSD. And here's the EPA, a reference for this particular work. And we found, we found remarkably similar results. MSD used XP SWIM and in their calibrated model and, and measured data, they saw that the peak flow dropped 76% and the total volume of uh, flow dropped 36% from this 100-acre uh, hundred, hundred site. You, working with Robert Pitt and Winslam, we came up with a very similar number. So, with um, about half the drainage area addressed by as much green infrastructure as we possibly could at this particular site, we were able to drop the total volume by 30% and the peak by 76. Also um, in Fort Irwin, I'm working with my colleague, Steve Kramer, US Department of Agriculture, UC Riverside and the University of Arizona. UC Riverside is using hydras to look at infiltration. University of Arizona is looking at the AGWA, which is the Automated Geospatial Watershed Assessment Tool. It's a GIS tool that meets with Caneros and uh, SWAT. Interpretation of a contentment with subcatchments and flow through pipes. We are coming up. Uh, we are going to be comparing with swim results with AGWA results. AGWA has a different approach with their urban tool than what SWIM does. And we're, um, and we're hoping to see that they come up with the same answer. This work is um, underway. The Canaros tomb, kinematic erosion, is very useful for a dry area such as uh, the Mojave Desert in Arizona and the deserts in, at the U, you know, in Tucson, the U of A. And I uh, encourage all of you to take a look at uh, Tucson's uh, Agua tool, particularly the, the recently 2018 urban tool, because um, I'm very impressed with it so far. This project is underway and I'm hoping to get the, finish it this year. Okay, SWIM is the engine for the stormwater calculator. I don't know how familiar folks are with the stormwater calculator, but it was designed by Lou Rossman and Jason Bernagos uh, to help people, not necessarily a professional hydrologist or engineer or something, uh, come up with sizing the uh, rain garden permeable parking lot, uh, tree boxes uh, at their site. What the stormwater calculator does is you can put in your location, it can look up for you the soil, the infiltration rate, the topography, the meteorology, it has a climate adjustment tool, you can put in various different types of um, 
green infrastructure. Uh, you can come up with cost and it can help you calculate rain, rain garden. If you wanted to go to your one acre house, one acre uh, plot and put in a rain garden to take your roof runoff, you could use this tool. Um, currently, we're working to update the yearly cost data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We, we have um, in Jason's uh, 2021, it, it talks about regionalized planning costs for green infrastructure. The, and when this tool was released in 2013, the, the historical meteorological data came up to 2006, a very um, capable ORI's uh, postgraduate, Colleen Barr, is working to update the data to 2019, and she's pretty close to having that release. We have a climate adjustment tool. It was based, it was released in 2013 from CREATE 2.0. We were working to upgrade it with more recent climate adjustment data. This is a very um, useful tool. A lot of folks find it very easy and intuitive to use. I recommend anyone to take a look at it. And a lot of professors use it to get their students up, you know, started on what kind of data you need and how to run SWIM without getting into the mechanics of having to run SWIM. Okay, so we're, we're working on the hydrology of SWIM and we're just starting to improve the water quality of SWIM. In the, the wash off from SWIM, it, um, calculates uh, the water quality from three different equations, the exponential equation, the rating curve, curve equation, and the event mean uh, equation. Many of the folks that get back um, in touch with us uh, say that they're really interested in water quality. In fact, they really want to add water quality to the stormwater calculator. We're looking into this and we're looking at how we can improve the water quality of SWIM. And I want to talk with you about some of the uh, empirical data that we're using to see of how accurate our methods are. There are three permeable pavement studies. Most of this work is, has been headed by uh, Michael Borst, the Edison, New Jersey, the Louisville, Kentucky, and the Fort Riley, uh, Kansas study. And a lot of work has been collected on, um, on the water quality aspects of infiltration. Again, um, now I'm going to talk about the permeable pavement lots in this one acre site that's in Edison, New Jersey. This is the home base for Michael Borst. He's been collecting data since 2010. And he probably has the most statistically comprehensive set of data that, um, that, uh, that one of the more uh, statistically comprehensive sets of data that are available, at least to me. In the permeable pavement, you can see they have porous concrete, which has much more infiltration than you see from conventional asphalt. Permeable interlocking pavers, again, and, can, and then conventional asphalt and porous asphalt. So they do have a high rates of infiltration. The infiltration, even though it gets clogged eventually and goes down, is still at least 100 times more adequate than um, what is absolutely necessary at this particular location. Uh, uh, Mustafa Ragamish and uh, Robert Brown and Michael Borst have all have done a lot of studies on infiltration, how it drops, how it clogs up. They even found a better method for um, measuring infiltration for permeable pavement systems. And here are the publications here. Uh, they took a look at uh, water quality and suspended solids. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Robert Pitt's stormwater water quality database. It's now on the International BMP website and the national average is about 100 in runoff. If you look at the infiltration from the PICP, about it's, it drops by about 50 percent. Porous concrete about seven, about 93 percent and porous asphalt about uh, 80 percent. So you see a lot of um, reduction in suspended solids. Those solids have to go somewhere and they end up clogging the uh, permeable pavement and there needs to be some sort of uh, maintenance for cleaning out these spaces. Uh, there's been some work done on actually calculating clogging. It's one of the things that a lot of folks use SWIM for, and they use it to calibrate SWIM. And uh, some of the, um, you know, you find that from the uh, infiltrating side, as uh, water clogs up one pour, it ends up going down the next and the next and the next. And you can calculate these based on the data collected on these sites. Another thing that um, we've looked at is chlorides. Originally for the maintenance of uh, this New Jersey site, when it snows, they put in sodium chloride and then eventually we moved to magnesium chloride and they looked at chlorides. 
And I know, I know this is a bit of a busy slide. If you look at this uh, dotted line here is the depth of snow. This blue line here is the depth of rain. In the winter, they put in chlorides and they end up having high. And in fact, the um, infiltration from these chlorides is high. It's above the acute level um, for, in, for infiltrating groundwater, but it quickly drops. Eventually it gets very low, then it snows again and it comes in. Uh, and throughout these slides, the PICP is a yellow dot, the porous concrete is a red dot, and the porous asphalt is a blue or black dot, uh, blue or black diamond. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at this, um, this uh, publication and, and uh, because there's a lot of really good information. One of the problems with chlorides is it called raveling. I always think that it looks like unraveling. For the porous concrete, we had a contiguous uh, porous concrete, but as we added more and more chloride to it, um, it ended up losing its structure and we have all this dust that was on our parking lot. The problem first became apparent 18 months after pouring the concrete. The uh, manufacturer of this concrete came back in May of 2011 and repaired it. By 18 months later, it came out and then they recommend not using icing chemicals on the concrete. They say within the first year, they may mean indefinitely, but currently um, they do not recommend using porous concrete with the icing chemicals. Um, we also looked at infiltrating metals. These particular data look at, uh, at copper. There's not that much difference between the curb cut, porous asphalt, porous concrete, interlocking uh, pavers, and the rainwater. Uh, we didn't see any particularly trend for uh, copper, and we saw even less for lead. It was pretty much through. We assumed that the lead would go right through a uh, interlocking paver because it's not really a porous media through which the men, lead, moves, lead moves, but rather an open space in which it falls. But these data can be very useful for calibrating swim. Also, I know this is a bit busy as well, um, but uh, we looked at nutrients. Uh, we looked at ammonia, nitrate, nitrite, total organic nitrogen, and total nitrogen. And uh, we found that in general, uh, the, um, the event mean concentration uh, was different across the uh, different surfaces. And, um, and we looked at nitrate infiltration from some rain gardens and we found the kinetics of nitrogen very complicated. But across the board, uh, different forms of nitrogen differed across the surfaces. And I invite you again to look at this a lot more carefully. See, I'm getting close to my time, so I better move ahead here. We looked at pH. The rain itself had a, its acid rain, 5.5, but the infiltration for the PICP was something like eight to nine, as was a porous concrete. Porous asphalt was the highest, 10 to 11. And the, um, and the asphalt, um, and this pH proved to be important when you looked at uh, bacteria that infiltrated. Aramillar, Silvacamar, and Tom O'Connor took a look at uh, fecal chloroform, endocrachy, and E. coli. Uh, what they found is that PICP, as we more or less expected, didn't really do much to change the um, reduction of uh, bacteria as it moved through the infiltrating water. But PC and PA definitely did, especially PA. And, uh, the authors assumed that it was the pH of uh, the porous asphalt that severely restricted the amount of uh, bacteria that infiltrated through the, through the uh, porous asphalt. Porous concrete also, less so for PICP. Um, and Michelonis and Catherine Lapith are in our research triangle park in North Carolina. They're, they work in the Homeland Security and they're interested in anthracene or radionuclides or any kind of t uh, terrorist or, or other um, harmful uh, exposure to the community. In the lab, they have a, well, a, a 26 foot indoor rainfall simulator where they can do uh, a lot of really controlled pilot scale studies. 
They do their field work out in Edison and they look at the uh, permeable pavement that we have there. And they use these modeling for PC swim. And so that should there be an exposure to a community, this particular one is in Detroit, they would know where to sample, what to sample, and they could uh, strategically sample the environment. They looked at various different uh, bacteria, but they certainly didn't look at uh, anthracene, which is whether their study was, and they found that the wash-off did not significantly vary by spore, and that uh, asphalt, as opposed to concrete, uh, had various different infiltration characteristics, and the asphalt increased removal of spores, and they attributed it to uh, increased kinetic energy. It didn't, re it didn't correlate with runoff rate. This work is underway. They're in the process of publishing it now. Uh, Michael Boris, Doug Beek, Steve Acree, Randall Ross, and Jessica Rumley have looked at uh, groundwater influx. When you have rain, rain uh, falls onto a surface area, it evaporates, it infiltrates. What is infiltrating doing? They're looking at an infiltration gallery that's in Louisville. And they looked at cations, anions, and uh, phosphate and nitrate. nitrite. And they found that in general, the uh, anions, which were bicarbonate, chloride, and sulfite decline, and they can at least uh, draw a line on what the five and 10 year impacts are projected to be. They looked at calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Similarly, they found that the same thing happened to nitrate and nitrite, but phosphate uh, was actually being an increase. So as we increase the infiltration, infiltrating water into uh, the groundwater, we're going to see some changes in the groundwater, and they've come up with it chemical model, which is here in this uh, EPA report that I also encourage you to look at. So in conclusion, um, we are constantly trying to improve SWIM. If you would like to improve the code itself, please join us at GitHub. We are comparing, uh, it, we are using SWIM to increase our understanding of GI. We compared SWIM results to empirical data for hydrology, for bioretention, bioswell, green roof, permeable pavement, infiltration trench. We are now starting and hope to actively look at water quality, um, how SWIM uh, projects water quality for permeable pavement, rain gardens, tree boxes, and planters, and we're looking at groundwater impacts. And with that, I appreciate you. I went longer. I was 45 minutes this morning. I must have been talking too much, but I certainly appreciate everyone being here. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, drop me an email and I'll do the best I can. And I'll also get the actual EPA lead investigator on your, um, uh, onto you uh, should you have any questions. Thank you for your attention. And that's all I have. Thank you, Michelle. That's one clap for a very, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, and excellent presentation. So um, we do have time for questions. <clears throat> um, uh, I'll read them. The first one comes from Mike Trojan. Uh, he's at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. A topic of concern these days is climate resiliency, particularly as it relates to increased rainfall intensities and increased rainfall event volumes. <clears throat> What, what effect might GI have on reducing peak volumes for large rain events? Has SWIM been used or could it be used for gaining an understanding of this? Yes, absolutely. SWIM and also the stormwater calculator have a climate adjustment tool. In it, they've looked at the CREATE data, and I don't know how familiar everyone is, but they, uh, there's different models that project climate change, and there's a there's nine different models that we looked at, nine, and then we have the average, we have the near term, which is 2065, longer term, 2060. We have warm wet, and I'm imagining that Minnesota as Ohio and the Midwest here with the Lake Great Lakes um, will probably warmer and wetter in the future. In the Southwest, it's gonna be hotter and drier, but we have different tools that one could use. And if you think about green infrastructure and you put in more plants, you're gonna have more evaporation operation. You're going to have cooler temperatures. SWIM does not yet address canopy and um, temperature effects, but, but green infrastructure should be a better, more natural system for mitigating climate, especially high heat and high evaporation. Uh, and then it will have more infiltration, so you have more groundwater recharge. And yes, you can use SWIM. You can use SWIM's climate adjustment tool. It's a plug-in into SWIM. And you can, uh, you can use it to improve the resiliency of your community and your design with, uh, uh, due to climate change. 
Um, thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, we have used SWIM for climate change uh, adaptation um, concerns, uh, and we found it worked very well. Um, the next question is from Judy Rondo. She says, can you recommend a model that is adept at modeling E. coli bacteria loads? They have difficulty uh, uh, accurately modeling E. coli load reductions. Are they using SWIM, you know, the exponential uh, event mean? Are they using SWIM to do it or? I don't know. Okay. In the case of SWIM, if you go to the SWIM reference manual, say, you know, they have fairly um, rudimentary water quality methods, uh, exponential decay, um, time delay, and event mean concentrations. And you can calibrate on the C1, C2. In fact, I'll just move up to that. Uh, Equation. I wasn't sure if it was. Okay, here we go. Anyway, you can use these um, these methods, and they give default values and ranges that one can data to it. I am not one hundred percent sure. I am starting to investigate how accurate these how how accurate SWIM is on doing that. Perhaps there are other models out there that do a better job, and perhaps we could incorporate them into SWIM. This is something I'm starting to take a look at. Uh, Louver Stefan has this question for you. Thanks for this interesting presentation. Does any of the research look into the effect of frosty weather of freeze-thaw cycles or freeze-thaw cycles on the permeability of rain gardens, permeable pavements, et cetera? I realize I'm talking to people from Minnesota here, and I realize that you guys, we first started just to ignore snow because it confused us. And now I realize this is yet another area that we have not exhausted to do. We, pur we purposely picked projects where we didn't have to look at snow because it was more, swim can handle snow. And, um, and we started to take a look at it at our um, permeable pavement that's in, um, that's, you know, in Edison. And I, since I'm talking to folks from Minnesota, clearly we need to put some more effort here. So that's all I have to say is uh, there is a there is a snow there is a snowpack uh, module within SWIM. Anyone here who would like to take a look at that, publish a paper, drop it to me to be the uh, reviewer. I'm up for. Uh, I, um, as I talked with you last week, I realized, oh my goodness, these are folks who really need to look at snow much more so. See, the rest of us are getting hotter and wetter and don't need to have to worry about it. I am born in Ohio and it, the winters were much colder before. And, and uh, we, we, and my sister, by the way, lives in Minneapolis. So I'm very familiar with uh, the first of October to the first of May snow cycles that are in Minnesota versus in Ohio, we have very little and a lot of freeze and thaw. So the short answer is we need to look at that. Um, the next question is from Cassie. Uh, her question is what green infrastructure improvements are most needed to promote wider adoption in cities across the country? All right. Um, my experience has been with Kansas City. I also have done some projects with here in, in you know, greater Cincinnati. If you're going to put in a pipe, if you're going to put in a tank, you know how to maintain it, you know how to size it, you know, these are well, you, know, you put in a, a cement culvert. My opinion is that, um, and it is really just my opinion, is that when you start to move into green infrastructures and growing systems, a strong alliance we have is in addition to the municipal uh, waterworks is to work with the city parks and to use parks and public properties. And because they need to maintain, particularly if it's a rain garden or a bioretention or a living system, we need to have the same, a different set of skills perhaps than what is traditional for those that have to fix uh, leaking pipes and, uh, and out of spec pumps and holes in tanks. And so um, it's a different set of skills it uh, definitely you need to have buy-in for your municipal waterworks because it is a bit different. And um, these are, you know, the waterworks system, you can't have water quality problems for drinking water, wastewater, uh, combined sewer overflows. So, you know, uh, those that have spent their careers on this are somewhat reluctant to try something new because should it fail, it's catastrophic. And if, and so it's a different set of skills and it's, you know, going to take, uh, 
you know, uh, you know, everyone has to work together and you need a multi, uh, a multi-discipline team in order to keep green infrastructure working where before you, you know, pretty much, and I'm a chemical engineer, before you really needed uh, the engineering skills to maintain a man-made system. Thank you. Uh, Andy Zasko from the city of Omaha has this question. What research are you aware of or doing yourself that looks at the role of plants impact on improving maintaining infiltration and green water infrastructure practices over time. This is an excellent area. Jason Bernagros is actually a landscape architect and I definitely feel and uh, in fact EPA has guidance on working with the parks and recreation. One of the things if you're relying on um, large scale public domain uh, uh, green infrastructure, you're going to need the landscaping gardening skills to maintain it. You want it to be, you want it to look finished like a garden. You want it to be robust and not a lot of care. You want to um, make sure you maintain it. And uh, for the rain gardens, and I, uh, the, the uh, folks, Michael Borston company spent a lot of time selecting the plants that they needed. We do know that plants will improve, the, you know, a different set of plants will have more evaporation, therefore less runoff, and this can be a really useful thing. And this is another excellent area that I would love to see academia uh, pursue as well as municipalities, and we'd love to work with them on this area. We always have more work than we do have people. Uh, great. So um, Brett Emmons uh, from Emmons and Living and Associates has this question. And it adds to Mike Trojan's question. Are you familiar with GI benefits to conveyance, sizing, and flooding? GI is often written off when looking at flood control. Is that justified or not? Huh. Well, um, I don't know if it's justified or not. I, I would like to think it is. I'm a I actually did some projects in China. And they use wetlands a lot for flood control. And, it's, and intuitively, it makes sense. Um, to see that. I would love to see uh, floodplains and um, by the way, uh, I didn't put it on the slide, but SWIM can also help as well as HSPF and SWAT with, uh, with flood control and using wetlands and using uh, river bottoms and things like that to help us out. And I, I guess I don't know that it's been written off most of the stuff I'm aware of are urban environments where they have, you know, waterways that are very active as yours is in, in Minnesota and um, as ours is here in Cincinnati. And, and so um, I, I think it can help. It probably isn't a panacea and it probably you can get something like 30% as opposed to 90%, which is what your consent decree requires. So it probably has to be working as a piece of, but perhaps not the ultimate answer to flood control. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Mike Eisensee. Um, he says, uh, the, the question is, what methodology, he's another question about uh, climate change. What methodology was used in SWIM to develop the future climate change condition? Atlas 14, IDF curve, updated IDF curve, storm transposition, historical trend, et cetera. He wants to know which one this is you? this is quite a timely question. This is something that uh, luckily we are working on right this minute. A year ago, to, what what we did a year ago, and I say we, uh, I was like you know they're cheering on the people actually doing the work. Um, was we looked at Create Two, we looked at different models in 2013. We did the Create Two and looked at different models. More recently, we are looking at historical data. We're updating SWIM's historical data, NOAA Atlas 14. Create 3.0, and we're looking at all of the above. We hope uh, Colleen Barr will be the lead on a publication. We're getting out on that. We used um, Create 3.0 when we can. We use No Atlas 14 when we don't have the data in Create 3.0. And then there's certain parts like the Northwest where we don't have No Atlas 14. And uh, so we cannot use that. But I know that Rob Traver is looking at upgrading the um, handbook for the, uh, the state of uh, Pennsylvania and he's looking at climate resiliency, and this is an active area of research for us. Okay, uh, Craig Fairbaugh has a question for you. 
Uh, thank you, Michelle. Has the EPA considered researching clogging function for bioretention rain garden systems? Similar to the work done on permeable pavers, this would be very helpful in addressing long-term performance and frequency of maintenance needed. We, yes, we would love to do it. We have the capacity of doing it. Um, we, we are, we, I invite you to go look at those data and uh, see if you can find something there. And that is something that, again, we're actively looking at. We've looked at it for a permeable pavement, and now we're working on rain gardens and bio areas. Uh, great. Uh, that's all the questions we have. Uh, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we'd like to give uh, Michelle uh, a round of applause. I'm going to give you the, my round of applause. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Andy Erickson. We are going to start the panel discussion now, and it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce our local experts to follow this presentation from Michelle Simon and continue the discussion on green infrastructure research. So my first panelist today is Mitch Hausstein, who is a stormwater and shoreland specialist at Anoka Conservation District. Mitch, can you give us your relation to this topic today? Sure, thanks Andy. And thanks to the entire Stormwater Seminar Series team for pulling together these great webinars and, and presentations. Um, also thanks to Michelle for that great presentation and all the efforts that her team has done to, to continually improve the, the, the SWIM model. Um, I've been at ACD, the Anoka Conservation District, for about 10 years now. Um, I've done quite a lot of, of modeling of green infrastructure practices uh, seeking to estimate their, their pollutant reductions. Um, the scope of those models has ranged anywhere from you know, an individual parking lot scale up to entire subwatersheds. Um, a lot of my time has been spent um, looking at potential practices and relatively ranking those based on cost effectiveness to try to pursue um, the best projects in the best places. And data availability for us has often been limiting for calibration. Um, so we've been striving to use the most up-to-date and locally relevant models available to us and certainly efforts by folks like Michelle um, are invaluable uh, and her team are invaluable for making that stuff happen. So really appreciate that. Thanks, Mitch. Our next panelist is Camilla Corral, who is a water resources engineer at Emmons and Olivia Resources. Camilla, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Um, so Emmons and all of your resources in, is an engineering consulting firm. So as consultants, we represent a number of watershed districts, watershed management organizations in the state of Minnesota, as well as cities. And we help them with watershed management planning work, as well as local surface water management plans. So green infrastructure is definitely a stormwater management technique that we promote to mimic the natural hydrology of a system. There's a place for gray infrastructure, but there's also a big place for green infrastructure when we look at changes in land use and how to mitigate the impacts of those changes. And you know, using tools like SWIM or HSPF or water quality tools help us then quantify the reductions that we can see in terms of stormwater management. But green infrastructure also provides that added benefit that we um, see benefits or improvements in quality of life, in uh, habitat, and urban heat island impacts or effects, as well as uh, air quality. So being able to sort of quantify all of the benefits to a client is really an important aspect of promoting and getting people to adopt green infrastructure. That's great, Camilla. Thank you. Our next panelist is Kristen Seaman, who is an environmental resources specialist at the city of Woodbury. So Kristen, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Yeah, thanks everybody for being here and having us today. Um, as, the, as the city of Woodbury, we're a developing community. So we have some infrastructure that's a little bit older and we have new stuff coming in as well as redevelopment projects. So reviewing, um, different plans and models to make sure that they're meeting our existing requirements for quality and quantity is really important and helpful to have these tools kind of to check to make sure that we're on the right path. 
Um, additionally, with Atlas 14 and climate change, those are big impacts to us as a city with our residents and business owners. So um, definitely a lot, a lot of stuff going on. And the porous pavement stuff was interesting too, to make sure that we're installing things that are going to last for as long as they can. And then if they're not going to um, make sure that we have the right maintenance plan so that they can last for the, the purposes that they're being installed. That's great, Kristen. Thank you. So I won't ask for Michelle's relation to this topic because we had the keynote presentation from her. Uh, before I dive into questions, I do want to thank all of our panelists and Michelle for making this seminar possible. Obviously, without all of you, we couldn't do this. So I do always want to thank our local experts and our invited speakers for making this seminar possible. So our first question I want to start out with, our, our topic today really centers on integrating green infrastructure research and data, field data, monitoring data into the tools that we use to manage stormwater runoff. And that's, you know, as we saw in Michelle's talk, both for quantity and for quality. We have to protect both aspects for our water resources. So I wanna know from our local experts, and, and Michelle, you can chime in on this as well. What do you think are the biggest advantages of using models like SWIM or other models like WindSlam and P8 and HydroCAD uh, in supporting our planning and our decision making, how how do we? What are the biggest advantages there for these tools? And anybody can jump in. This is an open panel. I can jump in, Andy, and take a stab here. Um, I guess personally, we're in our office. We're using it to really evaluate multiple scenarios quickly. Uh, you know, we might be looking at, in the case of a larger scale subwatershed on the order of a thousand to a couple thousand acres, lots of opportunities for green infrastructure placement. Um, we can quickly evaluate a lot of different scenarios with treatment trains, um, practices scattered throughout the areas, and, and throw some estimated costs at those and, and do some relative ranking. That's been one of the, the biggest advantages that, that we've, we've had. I, I can also say um, we have to fight with our management all the time. Like, why, why aren't you finished with SWIM? Why do you still need to develop SWIM? Isn't it done? And, so, and, and you know, and of course it's never done. But, um, but nonetheless, I find myself personally, when I start to model something, I really, it forces me to understand the system. I think I understand it, but when I start to model it, and this is, I'm doing this, right at this moment with Fort Irwin. And I'm looking at how swim models versus the urban tool at the Agua model to say, okay, is this accurate? Do I physically understand what's going on? And it is useful as another tool um, to, um, to use swim. I use, WIM, I use WIMSLAM for the Kansas City project. And, uh, and plus, what is the most important data? You know, you can do, I, I use a PEST to do parameter sensitivity and calibration for the models. And what is the most important data that we need to measure? What is less important? And so I think this, you know, a lot of people, I used to work for a boss who hated models and didn't see any reason to them. And I said, well, how are you gonna do your experiment? When are you gonna take your data? What data are you gonna take? What's the, and he's like, oh, I think, you know, I just, I just go in at the, you know, the seat of my pants. <laughs> And, and that was fine, I guess, for him. But I really recommend, and WinSlam, by the way, there are models that are deterministic like WinSlam. There are statistical models. I'm sorry, deterministic more like SWIM. There's, you know, you can use SWIM for Monte Carlo statistical uh, calibrations, but WinSlam is a very empirical model where you can get a lot of empirical data and use WinSlam. And I think they're all good. Other responses to the advantages of, of using these types of tools in our planning and decision making. I really loved your response, Michelle. I think that that you know this concept that it really forces us to understand a system is really important. So you know, looking at the scale of the model, being able to use a model like SWIM to uh, simulate hydrologic and hydraulic um, flow through at a watershed scale is really valuable because, you know, to just do it at that community level and not really recognize that there's flow coming into your system and then flow leaving your system and what the impacts are to downstream communities, landowners, or resources is very valuable.
to just add from the city's perspective, um, or I guess the permitting perspective, that it helps us meet our permit requirements to make sure that we can show that we've done the, the check, we know what we're doing, we know what we're installing, what we're approving, and that it's going to meet our downstream goals um, as an MS4 community, that's kind of our goal, why we have a permit, why we have stormwater ordinances, and I'm sure other organizations that have the same kind of focus of like, will this fit in the larger scheme of our stormwater management plan? Yeah, I think those are all great responses, right? It gives us a sense of, of the entire system, right? We can't monitor every point in the watershed, but we can use a model to represent every point in the watershed. Right, and so we can understand what's going on in different parts. We can understand the significant significance of not only the inputs, right, what data is most important, but even in a planning perspective, what parts of the watershed seem to be contributing the most to the problem we're trying to address. Uh, and oftentimes it can be very hard to do that with data unless you have collection all over the system. So I see where models can save us a lot of money. They can save us a lot of time and effort to be able to implement this on a large scale and get a lot of information. Uh, but then on the, on the other side of that, I wanna, I wanna flip the question around and say, well then what are the biggest challenges or limitations? Obviously using models is not a silver bullet, right? It's not the only tool in our tool belt and it can't solve all of our problems. So what kind of challenges or limitations do you, have you run into or, or what would you explain to perhaps a client or a property owner or a stakeholder in how you use these models and how you're careful with them. I, if you want me to start, I can start. Obviously, for consent decrees, uh, you know, we want you to reduce your combined sewer overflow by 80%, so a number. And, and, um, and we're talking, and SWIM especially is used to, you know, to design the combined sewer overflow response to reduce uh, combined sewer overflows both in number and in volume. And a lot of our regional folks in the state revolving funds are saying, well, the SWIM model said it was going to reduce by 92%. We're good. You know, what more do we need to do? And the model result isn't the result. The model result, you need to do monitoring. You need to confirm. It's an iterative process. Like you're never done developing SWIM. You're never done, you're to, you know, developing your combined sewer overflow and, you, and system and other, you know, uh, hydraulic systems within it. So uh, one of the things I always caution our folks, our regional folks, is um, you really need to understand what are the assumptions of the model, what are the um, uh, what are the, the what are the most sensitive parameters within the model, and you know, and then you need to confirm whatever the model predicts when you build your system. And we're talking decades and billions of dollars. And uh, that's why I've tried to convince my management, we really need uh, swim expertise in-house and we really need to understand it because these are huge. These are huge decisions. And, um, and you know, my hope is in the next 20 years, we really work hard on our infrastructure. And so we need to be able to predict it as well as we can so we can design it as well as we can. I would add to what Michelle just said by saying, you know, it's important to match the need with the tools that we're using. So I always try and have a conversation with clients about what is the question or what is the answer that you're looking for to make sure that the tool that we're using matches that answer because we spend a lot of time and resources developing a SWIM model when maybe that's not the right tool for the question that somebody's answering. And more and more tools are being developed all the time. So sort of, you know, trying to get an understanding of all the tools becomes a challenge itself. And then I would also just say another complication is, you know, it takes a lot of technical skill to develop some of these modeling tools. And sometimes the clients like municipalities don't necessarily have that skill set to then take the tool from a consultant and use that tool moving forward. So again, not only matching the tool to the need, but maybe matching the tool to the capacity of the of the client that you're building it for, if that's possible. Yeah, that's great. What other what other challenges or limitations have you encountered or, or recommend when you're talking to stakeholders and property owners? One thing that I've seen is that um, modeling changes over time, that kind of evolution and trying to explain to somebody like a council member or a resident that that was the best information we had 
had at the time. Now we have new information, maybe new inputs. Like I said earlier, Atlas 14, but it doesn't mean that we did anything wrong the first time. It just means that, that there's more information or external circumstances that kind of change the results of the model. And I, I know we've struggled with that. There's also like our model versus maybe somebody else's model of a similar area that use different inputs and assumptions and trying to, to piece that out for, for somebody who's trying to understand, well, what does that mean for my property? What does that mean like for my risk of, you know, living here or, or working here and that kind of thing? I agree with everything that's been stated. And I, uh, the model assumptions is something that a couple of folks have mentioned here. And I think that obviously they're important and we, we strive to be very transparent and document all of the assumptions that are being made so that when models do change and updates come through and we start to try to compare back to previous models, we have those resources available to us in previously completed reports, et cetera. Um, so we know where that was coming from. And I think presenting those to your stakeholders is, is critical for uh, a good understanding of what's going on. And that's, and that's part of the challenge, right? We're using these models to help make decisions and then and the models change and the inputs change or we get, collect more monitoring data and we calibrate the model. You know, and at one point we say, well, this is the answer, this is the best and, and we make decisions on it. But then explaining that later, uh, it's, not, it's never the exact answer, right? Then it's a number, but that's not necessarily reality because we're, we're always improving how we do these things. So that's the challenge is we don't wanna make it seem like we don't know what we're doing but in some ways we don't really know exactly what we're doing <laughs> uh, until we get a model complete and it's never really complete. So we're getting lots of questions from the audience. I'm gonna take a few of these now. Uh, the first question, the highly voted question uh, at the top of the list for me is that we have a point of controversy when it comes to green infrastructure. And this actually relates to a question that, that came up for Michelle and her presentation as well. And the question is, does uh, green infrastructure implementation result in better flood control? Uh, most green infrastructure is based on infiltration and that is relatively slow in removing stormwater volume, again, depending on the size and the scale and how it's designed. Uh, therefore, it seems that, that GI may not be very effective in controlling runoff from these intense or uh, um, extreme, perhaps, storm events. So uh, the question specifically says, what does EPA research show in this topic? But I also want our local panelists to describe how are they using the tools when thinking about intense or extreme events locally and how, and how we make better decisions based on that and, and looking forward into the future when we're designing infrastructure. I'll start because I really want to listen to what the other folks say is, um, yeah, we have used uh, SWIM and I know a lot of people use PC SWIM in particular because they have a 2D aspect to it to do flood control. One rain garden isn't going to control the runoff of the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul. You know, you're going to need to have um, you're going to need to have a properly sized wetland, floodplain, stuff like that. And uh, while it can help, it's not going to you know be a panacea, as I said before, for uh, Hurricane Sandy coming through or something like that. So we need to have an understanding of all of that kind of stuff. In the case of Houston, when you think of Harvey, Houston's very flat. It's very saturated, there's very little Vado zone. And um, when it flooded, it took forever to empty. And you know, and this is something that we need to understand. So the models and green the models can help predict the response of the watershed, whether it's has green infrastructure or not. And um, and we have to understand this when we're when we're altering the natural environment, but we're you know, and we need to uh, prepare for extreme events accordingly. To piggyback on what Michelle said, you know, I think there's a place for using green infrastructure to shave off those peaks, right? And to try and manage, you know, as much as you can, starting looking at that watershed approach, right? Starting in the uplands so that you're contributing less runoff to the places that are prone to flooding at the bottom of your system. But, you know, you can use a tool like SWIM to show how much you can shave off with green infrastructure and then to show what the impacts are going to be to those downstream portions of your system. And part of the value of modeling these extreme events is to manage expectations and to help decision makers figure out what amount of risk they're willing to live with or what amount of risk they might have to live with 
moving forward and how that informs future land use planning. One thing we're trying to do is, you know, when working with, working with green infrastructure, working with typically small footprints in already built out areas. And so um, if you're going to put a rain garden in, you're limited in the footprint of that and you can't always go as big as you might hope. But there are ways to maybe pair it with some additional underground storage below that rain garden to really try to maximize the volume storage that's possible there um, in that limited footprint. And as Camilla and Michelle said, you know, there are opportunities for that green infrastructure to reduce the peak a bit. Um, I think it's a another tool in the toolbox um, to be paired with larger regional practices. And I think, you know, the, uh, a I, I should say a, a professor when I did my undergraduate degree always said, as an engineer, you're designing for something to fail, right? You're designing the point at which something fails because everything fails at some point and under certain conditions. And there's certain extreme events that you, we can never design our way out of, right? So I, I love that response of, of risk. And that actually has been a, a key word in more recent years, talking about risk assessment. What is our level of risk? What are we willing to accept, right? And I feel like residents are getting more and more accepting of, we have big events that there's going to be water in the streets and they probably will see rain gardens flooded in spaces like that. So there's certain things that we can't completely design our way out of. Uh, so I, I agree with all those responses. Kristen, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button quick enough, but um, the only thing to add would be, uh, in addition to that risk, would be making sure that you have that redundancy built in as much as possible, especially around really critical infrastructure um, that you have redundancy, but then also maintenance access so that if something is blocked, your crew can get out and kind of address it as soon as possible and um, definitely clear risk communication, but then just making sure there's like plan A, plan B, plan C um, for when those big storms are gonna come. Can I add one more thing, Andy? So I'm also thinking about, you know, what do, what do we mean when we talk about green infrastructure? Because we can use a model at a watershed scale to think about maybe changing some land uses, right? And taking some lands either that are going to redevelop, maybe putting that back into prairie or something that has a higher ET value. So just thinking about what it is that we mean when we talk about green infrastructure is important. And, and, and tools like this allow us to do a lot of scenario planning so we can look at land use conversion in different parts of the watershed, you know, temporarily or permanently to see how we can continue to shave off these volumes of water that are contributing to the big problems. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so another question here, actually, uh, again, uh, it has, it talks about EPA, but it, it actually relates to all of us, I would say. Uh, so it, it, the question is EPA staff and management, but arguably I would say anybody in, in Minnesota as well, and water resources managers have been strongly supporting the use of, and in some cases where we have the ability to regulatory pressure or authority to push green infrastructure, right? And again, based on the research, uh, that may be the best types of practices we should be using to manage stormwater, right? And, and, and so many people may consider the EPA or again, local stormwater managers here in Minnesota to be the cheerleaders for green infrastructure. Uh, how can we do that and still be objective, right? We don't necessarily want to say uh, green infrastructure is the silver bullet. So how do we be objective and transparent and clear, uh, not only in the research, but in the outreach and the communications of this so that everybody understands, yes, as we said before, maybe this is the best current state of practice or design theory, but it could change in the future and there may be better ways to do this. So how do, we, how do we be transparent about that, be objective, and at the same time still promote what we do think is the best current practice? If you want me to start on behalf of the EPA, in, when I started in 2010, EPA was definitely a cheerleader, and definitely saying you need to go through this. What EPA has done is we make adaptive management. You put in, you know, you use SWIM or something, WinSlam or something to design your system, if it doesn't work, you can adjust it later on. And we are assuming that in a city, particularly in a municipality that's trying to meet some sort of an MS4 combined sewer overflow or something to create, they're gonna have 
uh, parks and recreation. They're going to have gardens, you know, aesthetically. And so what we encourage them to do, and there's EPA, uh, you know, guidance on this, is to um, is to use your parks and other uh, ornamental green infrastructure type stuff you would do anyway to improve your resilience for, uh, you know, for stormwater runoff. And and but you continue to monitor, you continue to adapt. If you change, you know, in in the event that you need to change, you can do so. So we we do have a a, a um, statute in there for adaptive management, so that if it isn't correct and it doesn't work, it doesn't work as well as it was hoped. You can still change it as you go along in your consent decree and other uh, long term control plans. From the city's perspective, I would think. Um, or what I've seen is that just having consistency of these are our preferences or our priorities and then trying to highlight when green infrastructure adds an ecosystem services benefit. I know a lot of different plans that have been updated recently talk a lot about pollinators and um, kind of like cooling effect of trees and those other things that we prioritize as a society and um, having those kind of forefront of like we will accept this because of these reasons additionally. Um, has gone a long way for us. Any other comments on that? I think I was only going to add that, you know, you, you can really use a tool like uh, an H&H model to really show, you know, here's what your landscape looks like with green infrastructure or with natural assets like Kristen talked about, right? What are the current ecosystem services that natural features in the landscape that people aren't necessarily working with? What services do they provide? And then take those services off the landscape or take that green infrastructure off the landscape and then model that same event. And it's easy to show, you know, the public and local decision makers how much runoff is, how quickly and how much runoff is getting into the system. And so I think I hope that's the, went on mute there by accident. Absolutely, yeah, my button. I hope that's the objective way that people can show that green infrastructure is going to help. And then, you know, providing that cost benefit information like Kristen also alluded to, and showing the multiple benefits that these practices provide for a community is, is huge. No, I think that's a great point. We, I've, I've hinted at the point that we model a lot of different scenarios and that's one of the benefits of these models is, um, so often we see the large regional scale model providing the most cost effective solution, but when you tack on the green infrastructure, it helps you get, because the, the regional practice alone is not enough to achieve your goals. And so you may need to, to bolster that with some of these green infrastructure practices. And I think, you know, something else to keep in mind with all of this is that an individual practice, even if it is the best for that situation can still fail. Right, you can have poor construction, you can have poor soils, or some unknown factor uh, that causes that particular system in that location to fail, and it's it's just something we have to deal with, right? So, we have to always keep these things in mind, and being able to communicate that effectively uh, is is kind of key. Uh, the next question I want to ask actually relates to crediting, and and that actually I think that fits well in this discussion. Uh, and it says one need at the local level is better research and data to support our regulatory credit system. Uh, if we, we need to meet permit requirements or TMDL goals or consent degrees or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and again, the question says, does the EPA provide research support in this area? But I also want to hear from our local panelists. How, how are you tackling this uh, concept of crediting? And, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the Minnesota crediting system. I'd like to hear about the Minnesota crediting system. Who wants to jump in first on that? <laughs> I, I'll just say something about the stormwater calculator. Um, for the panel here, have you ever used it, heard of it? Is there any the EPA's national stormwater calculator? Are you familiar with this little tool? Okay, it was done by Lou and Jason because they were going to have a stormwater rule and you were going to, um, you know, you look at the pre-development, post-development, and you can, you know, try to design your system to, to match post pre-development as much as you possibly could. They ended up incentivizing 
the stormwater rule as opposed to, um, let's see, uh, demanding the stormwater rule. So I am curious how each local community um, handles the crediting. This is something I, this is among many things you know far better than I. So I'll just say, so in Minnesota, we have our MIDS calculator, our Minimal Impact Design Standards calculator, and that is a tool, again, it's freely uh, available on the MPCA, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's website. Uh, and that is a tool that you can download and you can, you can input um, watersheds and add devices and you get certain credits for treatment, depending on the device and the sizing and, and things like that. So that's kind of the short answer to what we do for crediting. Uh, again, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual on the MPCA's website is a phenomenal resource, not only for design, but it talks a lot about crediting uh, for the different practices and how those things are calculated and what research and data goes into that crediting system. And I do know that Mike Trojan at the MPCA, who I like to call as the steward of the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, uh, works hard and has a number of work orders uh, to get more data and more information and better guidance uh, and more resources into that crediting system so that those credits are accurate as best as we can do from the knowledge that we have now. So uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment from their perspectives, you know, how they interact with this crediting system and, and maybe what could be added or needed to improve how we do this in Minnesota. I'm not sure if I'm thinking about crediting the same way that it's being asked, but the crediting that I'm thinking of is, you know, for a watershed district when, uh, or for a city, right? When they have certain stormwater management requirements, but those requirements can't be met on a particular site because of constraints like karst topography or wellhead protection areas or, or tight soils, right? How can we, you know, provide, develop a crediting system so that somebody who can achieve more volume rate control water quality can put that additional treatment into a bank of sorts so that another developer coming in can pull from that bank if they can't meet all of what they're trying or need to achieve on their particular site. Anybody else want to chime in on this question? just say from the city's perspective we definitely struggle a lot with tracking credits especially when it comes to like treatment of future roads and um, those phase developments that are 80 acres that get split up into you know anywhere from five different developments to 200 houses and roads and parks and a lot of infrastructure so it's it's a difficult situation to, to track those type of improvements and where things are being met and how um, but it's something that we're always working on to improve and i'll mention too uh you know there are a number of resources uh not only in minnesota but around the country uh and more specifically research that is going towards uh and being used for these crediting systems right how much how much credit or how much benefit do you get from street sweeping, for example? And, and, and how can that be integrated into the models and the tools, whether that's the National Stormwater Calculator or the MIDS, the Minnesota Impact, or uh, Minnesota's calculator. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of resources out there. And that actually leads directly into the next question uh, that comes from our audience. And, and again, how does, it, how does the EPA serve as uh, a research clearinghouse of information uh, and, and maybe, that we can expand that to say, what do we look for as our information sources when we are trying to not only improve our decision making and our planning and management, but in, in Michelle's case of improving our models or in our cases where we may be trying to calibrate our models or ground truth our models, right? We may use modeling, if I use street sweeping, just again as an example, we use a model to calculate how much benefit we get by implementing street sweeping what are the resources that, that our panelists use to ground truth that to say, okay, is that realistic or is that not realistic? So kind of two questions there. Where do you look? Where are the resources and references for data and research? 
Uh, and, and is there or should there be some national clearinghouse for this information? I always am the one to start, so I guess I'll just start since they say, what is EPA? Okay, first of all, there's an international BMP database. There's a national stormwater database on the international BMP database. All of the data that EPA collects is, and publishes is available on the Science Hub for anyone to use. I see a lot of the journals are now requiring that everyone provide the data as well as their um, as well as their you know analysis and, and uh, of these of these data epa will never be the clearinghouse use this data don't use that um a lot of data is and you know WinSlam is very local empirical um and you know and epa definitely encourages monitoring so that you know each individual does when I myself got started in 2010, one of the things I did is go to the Kansas City BMP manual to see what they recommend, what the, you know, uh, when you're modeling, um, you can put in your own rain gauges. If you don't, you know, NOAA has data. You should measure your infiltration. If you don't, USGS has Sergo and STAT uh, co data for you to use, and that's what's used in the National Stormwater Calculator. Um, there are climate change models and, you know, we are looking at those and incorporating them in SWIMCAT and SWCCAT and um, for extreme events. So there's national databases that have empirical data that every, and you know, many of them have, you know, you download it. Uh, we have a, a system called basins where it goes and gets you the data so that you can use it. We're probably going to put SWIM as well. it was in basins. Um, we had a drop, we had somebody retire and so before it was assigned to somebody else, we kind of had a hiccup, but we're looking to put swim back into data, into basin so it can help you get data. The single thing the National Stormwater Calculator does is go, that I feel is very useful, is it goes out, gets the data and helps you run swim. It's designed for small systems. It's definitely the back of the envelope. You're not going to design your uh, city of Cincinnati consent decree based on uh, stormwater calculator results, but it is very accessible. And uh, so there are national databases. It, you, it takes years, in my case, to get up to speed on where they are. It takes computer skills to extract the data and put them into your system. It's not trivial, but when you have um, very effective, uh, you know, there's the stormwater, there's EWRI, uh, that has, you know, the stormwater group and there's, you know, all kinds of people. I'm looking at your panel discussion. All those folks in all those universities are experts and have been working in this area for green infrastructure for 20 and 30 years. There's tons of data. The problem is there's too much and somebody needs to curate it and it's tough to do. And I would suggest to anyone they look in there. If I were in Minnesota and was interested in snow, I certainly would look at the University of Minnesota before I looked at, you know, University of South Florida on, you know, how to handle stuff. So that's, that's my two cents. Uh, the US EPA does not endorse or recommend or, you know, I, you know, that's only my own opinion. What are, what are our local panelists using for resources and looking to for, for ground truthing what they find out of the models or, or other recommended tools? Uh, Michelle touched on it. I, most of our efforts are in water quality modeling using WinSlam. Um, it's developed relatively locally, lots of Wisconsin based files that we're using as inputs. Um, that said, on a local scale, you know, we're using local rain gauges and using custom rain files. Um, we've done some localized monitoring of installed rain gardens to make sure that our infiltration rate assumptions are, are on par with what we're seeing in the field. Um, in cases where we might have some, some outfall monitoring data, certainly we're trying to incorporate that as well. There are some national databases and you know, if one were to get started and didn't have their rain gauges or infiltrometers or else, I would certainly recommend going to the national databases. They're free, you access them, Hopefully in your offices, you have somebody computer savvy, if not yourself to, you know, extract these data. It should cost you nothing but the time to look at it. And that's a great place to start. It's a great database. Absolutely. I would also put a plug in for the Minnesota stormwater manual that is updated um, frequently. Um, so that's a great resource to local people as well. 
Yes, and I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the BMP database, the International BMP database, Michelle. I actually popped a link into the chat for anybody that's not aware of that. Uh, I'm also going to drop a link to the Minnesota Stormwater Manual in the chat here momentarily. Uh, so people have that as well if you're not familiar with it. Uh, I'm going to jump into another question here. Uh, so we are finding uh, problems and challenges with older stormwater infrastructure techniques, right? Aging infrastructure and resiliency. That was a question that came up earlier was resiliency. So uh, beyond aging infrastructure that are affecting our hydraulics and, and pipes wearing down and things like that, we are also seeing it in water quality for our stormwater BMPs. And the example in the question specifically was phosphorus release from pond sediments or PAH contamination in these sediments uh, of stormwater ponds. And, and we can see uh, similar things in other BMPs. So uh, the question says, is the EPA prioritizing research to address these types of problems, the aging infrastructure problems and, and water quality aspects of these older treatment technologies uh, that are you know, obviously widely installed? Uh, and, and I'd also like to expand that to our local, local panelists you know, what are we doing locally to uh, manage or plan around this aging infrastructure and water quality problems that might come from it? Well, it's for the, I, I don't know if everybody gets annoyed if I'm the first one to speak, but they usually say, what is EPA doing? And so um, what EPA did have a formal aging water infrastructure project. And for us, it was a lot of money. Um, we put in five to ten million for five years and we have a whole series of stuff for aging infrastructure green infrastructure as well as trenchless technologies pipe uh condition assessment i don't know if any of you guys use soap you know uh, as you know there's various different things there's a whole program that epa put into aging infrastructure i've said before i really wish um that it was a priority for every administration to work on infrastructure, it was my fondest wish. I mean, we know uh, ASCE is saying, you know, a, a bridge fell down in Minneapolis for heaven's sakes. I mean, we really need to work on our infrastructure and um, we need to make it a priority. There's tons of data out there. Again, it's a it's gonna be, um, I, I would encourage anyone to start, you know, doing look at the literature, uh, water, uh, uh, water RF and, um, Weft Tech, you know, there's tons of information. There's tons of information in each different location. Certainly do your homework before you get started. Hopefully, you know, maybe this is our ticket out of the COVID law, you know, economic losses as we start to put people in, you know, in infrastructure. Right? And, um, and, you know, we do this in an intelligent, sustainable, reliant way. And I think, uh, I think it's not that we don't have the information. I think it's a matter of getting the information into the right hands to the decision makers to make the right decisions. I can go next from a maintenance side. The city of Woodbury, we've done pond maintenance for a long, long time. We have over a thousand stormwater ponds, both wet and dry, um, that we've done maintenance on. And, We've done additional study on some of our, our with our lake management plans, excuse me, with the puppy <laughs> um, to see if that exact question that you had, Andy, about phosphorus release in the ponds directly upstream of the lakes, if those should be a priority for us to do maintenance on them. And we haven't found that to be the case yet. We're, you know, open to the idea and definitely looking at it. Um, but just doing maintenance of ponds to restore them to their original design or if there's any type of rehab that we can do to improve it, you know, kind of like a 2.0 version of it of that was the correct design again in 1980 when it was installed, but where are we in 2021 and what needs to be done and if there's any type of changes that we can make. A lot of times it's hard with those older ponds because they were just like positioned between a bunch of backyards, <laughs> not a lot of extra green space, but in general, we do that. We look around in other areas in the same kind of neighborhood, same watershed to see if there's any other improvements we can make on a city park land or in right of way, those kind of things too. Uh, 
Um, I, we had some projects, I didn't discuss them because it wasn't particularly green infrastructure, but we use SWAT, you know, here in Ohio, we have a lot of farms, we have a lot of nutrient runoff. We looked at the economic, I, I say we, uh, my colleague Chris Niche, and if anyone's interested, drop me an email and I'll send you some really excellent papers on this. But using SWAT, how do you prioritize which, which pond to, to deal with first, what's the most um, important? Um, if you cut off, you know, if you use less fertilizer, he had a, an economic study on if you use, if the farmer uses less fertilizer, he, he or she loses X amount of crop, but we had Y amount of less hypothea in, you know, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So how do we start to quantify that? How do we optimize uh, interdiction systems so that we have less nutrients in our pond, our rivers, you know, and, in, and throughout our nation? And it's an excellent, excellent thing to look at. And, and again, you need some sort of a method to uh, model these things. You know, you can, you certainly need to measure, you certainly need to prevent, but you need to have some sort of a, of a mathematical system and it doesn't have to be SWIM, HSPF, SWAT, other wind slam, other models, whatever model you need to use, you do need to have some sort of a mathematical way to address changes in your system so that you can optimize your, your, um, your uh, method for preventing uh, nutrients going into the water systems, the surface water systems. I think that's a really good point. So I'd just like to piggyback on that, Michelle, you know, for like one watershed, one plan development, which is a program here in the state of Minnesota, you can't always monitor the impacts of putting in certain best management practices. So we often have to rely on the tools we used to design the practice to keep track of how many, how much reduction we think we're getting in the system. And then maybe 20 years from now, with enough data, we can support that we actually achieved those goals, but we sometimes have to use the models to track that performance. It's a little bit cruder, but we've been using a lot of our maintenance and inspection records paired with our infiltration rate monitoring to help guide our decisions on when a bioretention basin might need to be rehabilitated. You know, and I will put a plug in, I'm, I'm a big proponent for taking care of the stuff that we already have in the ground and making sure that it continues to work. Uh, it's often or likely the most cost effective solution possible. So, uh, you know, do we need to go in and, and remove a plant community or scrape down some soil that's, that's clogged up over time? Uh, we're trying to, to, I guess, use some of our, our inspection data to inform that. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, asset management, right? We have assets. We, we've spent, uh, in some cases, thousands, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of dollars on infrastructure within our respective jurisdictions. Uh, you know, we should maintain them and make sure that they are performing the way they should be. And I think real world data, you know, whether that's measuring infiltration rates or measuring the sediment depth, how much is accumulated, um, collecting samples of that sediment to understand what's in there. All of that gives us information on how these things are actually working. Uh, and, and one of the caveats, you know, again, kind of going back to my early question about limitations and assumptions, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, the panelists saying that we have to understand what the assumptions are, we have to be able to communicate what those assumptions are. And in many cases in our stormwater models, a lot of them don't necessarily account for that accumulation of sediment or pollutants within the BMPs. And they're not incorporating some of these, you know, recent uh, discoveries of PAH is being released from it or phosphorus released from stormwater pond sediments. You know, that's, those are things that are just simply not in the models right now. So keeping those kind of things in mind and, and looking at the research and finding out what data is out there and, and what do we know about these systems that's not being reflected in our models really helps us get a clearer picture of the whole system and how these things are operating. Uh, Another question, and because it relates specifically to green infrastructure and these practices, uh, the next question that we have here uh, actually is, is coming from Michael Irwin uh, in Durham, North Carolina. And he's saying that they have type D soils. So basically every stormwater control measure that they install comes with an impermeable liner as the native soils. So when we talk about green infrastructure, because many of our green infrastructure rely on infiltration what, what types of green infrastructure can we use in these types of locations? And I'm sure some of you have had to deal with sites or locations where type D soils are prevalent or in uh, northern Minnesota, we have some shallow bedrock. Uh, we have karst geology in parts of Minnesota, which also kind of limit 
uh, wellhead protection that came up earlier as well. So what do we do in these types of cases when we try to recommend green infrastructure to solve our stormwater management issues? Uh, being uh, the first one to speak at almost all the time. In, uh, in Louisville and in Cincinnati, it's a river valley, it's clay. In fact, my own house where I'm sitting here right today, I am right by the creek, I have clay. So I have to, and when we put in a garden, we had to break up the clay in order to have a nice, nicer uh, drainage system for our garden. What we did in Louisville is uh, there, was a, there was a gravel seam, like you go down and I'd have to look at it. I think you go down 10 meet, uh, you go down three or four meters and then there was a nice gravel seam. So we put in an infiltration trench so that we could uh, send the water to this gravel seam and the seam was in communication to the river. So we had to make sure we didn't uh, put in any, we, you know, we met, met standards so that we didn't have the runoff going into the river. And, um, but you can take it, you can take advantage of um, geology. You can put in, in, you know, you can engineer some infiltration galleries to get more infiltration. You can use these waters. In Camden, New Jersey, we collected water as opposed to infiltrated it. And then we put it into a um, inner city soup kitchen rain garden, a wonderful chef put, um, put together a soup kitchen and he had the community help him um, uh, garden and get the spices and the vegetables and everything we were concerned about whether or not we had too many metals or problems with the uh, uh, collected water but you can collect the water and this is really important in the southwest you really need to collect the water in um, they have green streets in Los Angeles and they have underground cisterns type things to collect water and then they can use it for their landscaping so I uh, 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 the gentleman from Durham, I mean, Bill Hunt has tons of work, tons of work. When I did the little study on the hydrology, I was like, why isn't there an overwhelming um, parameter that would be the most sensitive? And the answer is it's a rate limiting step. If you have a permeable pavement and you're clogged up and you can't get the infiltration in the first place through your permeable pavement, that's your rate limiting step. Eventually you're going to get into your native soil will only uh, infiltrate whatever it can based on the soil itself and you have to come up with engineering if it's not adequate to your needs. If, if, um, if water quality is your primary goal and volume reduction can't happen because of the underlying soils, you know, we'll rely a lot of times on filtration practices. So biofiltration or an underdrain is tied back into a storm sewer system, um, we're removing TSS, TP, other pollutants, et cetera. Um, through the media and then releasing that, that cleaner water back into the, the storm sewer system. I will add those locations and opportunities for that are much more limited because you typically need to be adjacent to a storm sewer or catch basin that you can tie into. And so opportunities aren't quite as widespread as if you have great sandy soils. We've seen um, water reuse for irrigation as um, a good, good solution for that, that condition of um, limits to infiltration, specifically with a goal of volume reduction. So that's been a, a, good, a good option. I could talk for an hour about all of the downsides and the questions I have that follow, but I think that's definitely something that, that we're interested in. And again, have the additional benefits of decreasing um, Reliance on groundwater for something like irrigation is a really big benefit to the city, but it's it's tough with karst and drinking water supply management areas and clay soils and sometimes all those things at once. <laughs> yeah, no, this is of, of crucial importance for the Southwest. They're going to get hotter. They're going to get drier. They better use every ounce of water they have. We do have folks who uh, focus on water reuse and um, it's, uh, it's crucial. It's going to be really, really crucial. And we as a nation, I mean, I'm looking at my shelf right over here and I see um, the big thirst, uh, let's see, um, river, uh, you know, all water 4.0. I mean, we as a nation have got to look at water reuse, infiltration, groundwater recharge. And it, it was always important, but it's of crucial importance. And when you have 10,000 lakes, you're in one situation. When you're in the Great Lakes state like Ohio, it's another situation. When you're in the Southwest, and remember I did go to the University of Arizona, um, you know, uh, 
uh, one of the reasons why Canaros is a model that I'm very interested in is that it looks at um, erosion. You know, when it rains, it pours. Uh, Tucson gets 12 hours, she gets 12 inches of rain and probably eight two inch rain and eight, you know, inch and a half rainstorms. So it really rains. It's friable soil. It erodes, you know, the soil. So the, you know, the, the rainwater management is very, very important in the Southwest. Uh, I also know for, for those types of situations, at least locally, uh, Carver County has done a lot because a lot of Carver County is in clay soils and tight soils that just can't infiltrate. So they've done a lot of work with their uh, regulations and recommendations for what to do in those types of situations. So if you're looking for something to look at locally, Carver County could be one place uh, to see what they do there for those types of situations. So I think uh, we're getting very close to the end of our time here. What I would like to do now is uh, close with a question for each panelist. Uh, and, and what I wanna ask our, our panelists to do is what are your key takeaways that we can give to our audience based on this topic? And uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things over the last couple hours, including the presentation and this panel discussion. Uh, but what are the key things that, that our audience can use in their jobs um, today, maybe, um, but maybe even looking into the future and tomorrow and beyond, that we can improve our water resources, we can improve our ecosystem health, right? Talk about quality of life. Uh, how do we improve all of that based on the topic that we have today? And I want to go through our panelists in the same order that I originally introduced them, and uh, we'll give Michelle the last word. So we'll start with Mitch. Uh, what would be your key takeaways from today and, and recommendations for our audience? I think you know, we've talked a lot about all the different models available for this. And I, I do think there are some out there that are quite user friendly and they can be intim intimidating at first glance if you haven't done any modeling, but I do encourage folks to, to reach out and, and maybe start trying to do some modeling. And it, it forces you to best understand the system. And I think a couple of the panelists touched on that. Uh, it, it does give you a, a greater understanding of what's actually happening out on the landscape. Um, and, you know, pairing that with GIS, et cetera, it's, um, it's really satisfying, I guess, to be able to do that and, and fully understand, or to the best of our knowledge, the system that's there. That's great, Mitch. Thank you so much. So our, we'll take our key takeaways from Camilla. So oh, I would just take away or remind everybody that these tools are dynamic, right? These tools are constantly changing, constantly evolving. And even as your landscape changes, you need to update your model to account for land use changes, to account for operations and maintenance, and to take all those things into account. And our climate is changing. So the, the data that we put into our models is also changing. So there's lots to think about and then how to communicate that to, to your clients or to the public is also an important thing. This is a snapshot in time, what we're presenting now, but subject to change, like Kristen said. So the whole thing is kind of dynamic and fun to think about. We'll never run out of work, right? If everything keeps changing, <laughs> we'll always have things to do. Uh, so Kristen, what would be your key takeaways today? Yeah, for me, I always land on the word holistic, that this modeling is so important and kind of is step one of will it fit, will it not fit, what are the goals and that whole system. But I think you, you need to be including planning, uh, the operation maintenance staff for sure, and kind of designing with that at the forefront of your mind of how do we continue to change this as we progress. Because when you're installing a system, you want it to last 25 to 50 years. I hope that it's going to be be around for a long time that you need to have those those in those plans in place of when are we going to inspect it, when are we going to maintain it, when are we going to increase it or rehab it, and, and how will we have access to that. Um, and then I think, Michelle, you spoke of it a little bit in your presentation, is that the, the landscape and kind of the vegetation that goes with it, that needs to be thought of when you're designing it as well, so that you're going to design it if, if vegetation is included, which it usually is for green infrastructure, how does that fit and will it actually match? Um, and just yeah, again, grabbing all the, the different players and getting them involved right away so that we are making these systems that are going to last with everything else changing around them. 
Absolutely. In fact, it's funny about plants. I love the Minnesota gardens. And my sister's in Minneapolis. And I've, I've been to Scandinavia and they have these beautiful gardens because they have these cool, wet, late summers. But um, so you don't want to, you know, put an invasive species into your rain garden when you're trying to improve your uh, infiltration. And, and this really is very important, particularly on the prairie and in the desert. But um, I was just going to say that there is a lot of information in the government, USGS, NOAA, um, let's see, uh, you know, soil. Uh, iTree, by the way, is a uh, forestry's uh, model on trees and canopies and, and temperature effects. There's so many, there's so many public domain free models that you can have the code and everything, which uh, HSPF, um, uh, SWIM, we have, a, uh, we have the different models. In fact, I have a compendium of all the surface models that, you know, that they're there. And so uh, I certainly encourage you all and anyone who's listening to take advantage of the information that is collected by the Department of Interior, the EPA, the Department of Commerce. Uh, see what the, what the government can do. For, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. And um, I definitely think that there's a lot of stuff that uh, can really help people. But in the end, it's a local decision. It's you know a local call. It's going to be contingent on local um, data and parameters. And I know it's challenging, but I think we can definitely do it. And I think we have to, and so we will. That's great, Michelle and, and panelists. Thank you for those key takeaways. Uh, I think I can speak for uh, all of us. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, and and Michelle uh, shared her email address earlier. If you registered for this seminar and are watching it live, you'll also receive an email next week uh, with more information and the questions and the answers. Uh, with that, I would like to close our panel discussion. I want to say thank you to Michelle for giving our keynote presentation and setting up the topic. I want to thank our panel members, Mitch Haustein, Camilla Carell, and Kristen Seaman for being on the panel and providing this discussion. Uh, and I want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in and making this seminar uh, so popular and so successful. We are very thankful that we can get this information out and that people are interested and enjoying it and getting something from it. So that is our thanks to you today. Uh, and with that, we will close the seminar and the panel discussion. And I hope to see you in the next seminar uh, in February and then again in March of 2021.